John, a uh, friend of the show, back with us, Tommy Pham. This should be good. I mean, he was mic'd up on ESPN, and I have to uh, thank him for dropping my name in there. That was very nice. I didn't expect that. I don't know if it was because he's coming on, but uh, always great to hear from Tommy. Very, very honest guy, uh, so we love that and looking forward to it very much. Yeah, we have a lot to ask Tommy about his trade, his time with the worst team in baseball, the White Sox, a lot more. John, you and I are going to talk about Pete Alonso, Glaber Torres, some teams that are good, are they great, and a little more. And we'll play Hit and Air at the end if you stick with us on the show with Joel Sherman and John Hayden. John, I, I wonder if you and I could talk about a phenomenon. You you brought it up to me. Uh, we haven't really discussed it in, in any detail, but there's no team playing 600 ball in the major leagues right now. And we've seen teams kind of go into these incredible swan dives. You know, the Yankees had about a month there where they were 10 and 20. Uh, the Phillies, uh, the Phillies are 4 and 13. Uh, since they were 62 and 13, only the 0 and 18 White Sox are worse in that period than the 4 and 13 of the Phillies, who look like they were kind of running towards 100 plus wins. I'm not sure if anyone's going to get to 100. What, what do you think we're going through this? Yeah, I don't know. Nobody on pace for 100 right now. The Yankees were the best team in baseball for over two months. Then they were the second worst for over a month. Uh, Phillies, I mean, we kept hearing how great their clubhouse is, and I believe it. I think they have a great, great clubhouse and a very balanced team, and they've been, frankly, terrible, and I hear that there's a lot of anxiety in that front office right now, and uh, you get it? I mean, they, they've been bad. Um, I don't know. We've hit one of those parody years, right? I mean, how many years is there nobody with 100 wins? And maybe someone will rally. I mean, the Dodgers are not heading that way, and that's rare for them. They've had a ton of injuries. They keep acquiring guys who've got an injury concern. I think good players, but with an injury concern. Uh, Yankees look like they were world beaters forever, and I'm not sure what happened to them. And that that tailspin lasted way too long for what it should have been. Uh, the Phillies, it's more of a, just a deep dive down, straight down, you know, more than a long one. But uh, I'm surprised because I thought the Phillies and the Yankees were really great uh, through the first 70, 75 games. Yeah, you know, Dodgers uh, were 52 and 32 plus 125 run differential, last 29, 14 and 15, minus 27. If they win tonight when we're doing this, they actually pass the Phillies for the best record in the league. The yeah. Phillies have had the best record in the league since May 4th in the National League. John, I'm, let me test drive some. I, again, you threw it out, so I suddenly started test driving some things in my head. Uh, is it possible that the, uh, the um, balanced schedule – has created some stuff because like, you know, if you had 19 games against the White Sox, for example, instead of 12 to 13, <laughs> you could build it up. And every division had one of those. I'll tell you one that I really have been thinking about a lot because it really was with the Phillies and Yankees. The Phillies and Yankees, when they were great, the length of their starting pitching was terrific. Like all five guys were purring pretty much. Four guys for the Phillies, five guys for the Yankees were pretty much purring along. I just wonder between injury how much we use bullpens and how hard every guy throws on every pitch now it's such a max effort thing can we just not get great starting pitching from soup to nuts anymore yeah so like like it I feels like the Yankees it. starting pitching kind of died a month ago it feels like the Phillies starting pitching died three weeks ago and I just yeah. wonder are we kind of messing up the game so much that nobody can make it through the season well yeah, I think injuries and attrition are the equalizers. I think that's it. I, I don't think it's the schedule. I mean, you know, uh, fewer games against the AL East should be a better record for the Yankees, right? And and for the Orioles, uh, not a worse record. So I don't know. Somebody uh, smarter than me would have to figure that one out. But certainly the injuries are uh, definitely a thing this year, particularly the great pitchers. Uh, you know, I saw a stat that I couldn't believe. Uh, the top 10 hardest throwing starting pitchers have all been on the IL this year, except for Hunter Green. And obviously Hunter Green has been fantastic and he's a Cy Young candidate at this point. I mean, it's really wide open. The National League who's going to win the Cy Young. It's what, probably wide open the American League too. But, uh, you know, I do think the injuries are, are the major factor this year. I know that the MLB probably doesn't want to publicize that and then certainly got downplayed a bit, but, uh, it's been crazy how many great players have been hurt, particularly pitchers. 
You know, John, if you look at the Cy Young races, aside from maybe Corbin Burns in the AL, if you think Zach Wheeler's in the NL, it's all non-brand guys. Right. People like, uh, and 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 I, again, I just wonder if this is the future, like starting pitching, like we're turning relievers into starters. Many of them are doing well, but what's their durability? So many Tommy John surgeries. And just again, max effort after max effort after max effort. I wonder if we're going to go that way. Yeah, John. it's relievers into starters and rookies that have done it, right? Schemes, yeah. uh, Imanaga and certainly, I mean, the, the relievers, uh, Lugo and Lopez, uh, Crochet. Uh, but Lopez it's, just got hurt, right? He's going to yeah. be put on the IL. John, you mentioned the uh, closeness of the Cy Young races, the closeness of the, especially the National League wild card, so many teams in it. Uh, just to focus on our backyard a little, uh, again, it was something you brought to my attention. Uh, Pete Alonso said our colleague Mark Sanchez was one of the people who had it. He was asked about not having that good a year this year, and he countered and essentially said, um, I was an all-star. I might have 40 homers still. I'm not going to get down on myself. You know, John, I looked at it. His slash line, 243, 26, 456, it's kind of Dom Smith's slash line, 242, 327, 424, or Carlos Santana, 244, 329, 430. I mean, those guys are free agents at the end of the year also. So who's uh, Christian Walker, who's had a better year than him, and Reese Hoskins and Paul Goldschmidt and probably Anthony Rizzo. I, I just wonder, like, does he still think he's getting all that money out there? Is it weighing on him? What, uh, uh, tell me what you yeah. think about Pete. Yeah, I, I think he, you know, he was demoted to fifth, so he probably wasn't in the greatest mood, although he didn't, you know, say that, which I think is the right thing to do. But I think he got a little defensive when the question came up and, you know, he's put on the spot and, uh, you know, if he's thinking about his free agency, the case is his career, right? His OPS with and right, right now, I think the issue for the fans more than anything is not the overall slash line, it's the runners in scoring position slash line, right? And he's under 700 OPS runners in scoring position. But the case for him is that he was 945 lifetime runners in scoring position, OPS, and it's, he's now down to 909, which is still in the top 10 of active players. And, you know, he's had a great career. He plays every day. He's made himself into a reasonable defender, average defender, close to average defender. You know, there is a good case to be made, but, you know, you know I guess you don't want to be making that case uh, publicly. And I, I just I just think he shouldn't have been citing the All-Star game or – you know, he's, he's on pace for a certain number of home runs because, you know, I think the fans are looking at it like he hasn't really hit great with runners in scoring position. He was demoted for a reason and just going to have to take it at this moment. So, you know, I think he could have uh, said something better because I do think he has a case to be paid a lot. If you look at the offense overall in baseball, how it's going down. But, you know, in this lineup, they got a lot of good players. In this city, we have the two best hitters in baseball, arguably. I mean, I could throw Otani in there, too. But two of the three best hitters in baseball, you know, it doesn't look like he's having a great year. And he's really not having a great year. But his career has been great, and that's really the case. Yeah, and look, there's still 50-ish games to go, and the Mets are in this. And you know what the fans will remember at the end? If he had a great 50 games and helped them get in. Uh, you know, the Mets right, have only exactly. been in, you know, the Mets have only been in once uh, dur during his time with the team and his time with the team might be coming to the end. Part of that discussion also was him talking about getting into the playoffs. Well, there is some pressure on him in multiple ways then down the, the stretch here. But I always lean back. Paul O'Neill once said something I quoted all the time, which is when your team wins. Everyone had a good year because then when you win, people look and go, oh, remember, we won that tight game in Philadelphia where that guy might have hit 211, but he won us the game and stuff like that. So there's still this stuff out in front of him. Let's transition to another guy in his walk here. Yeah. No, 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 let me just say yeah. on this. I, that was, I think that's true and should be true. It's a little bit less true now where everybody's focused on everyone's individual stats. Right. Uh, so, I mean, that I, I get why he said it. Uh Probably wasn't the moment to say it. I've seen, heard some stuff on the radio, and it's tough to counter it. His case is that he's been a great Met, and you know he's 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 let's frank be frank about it. He's having an off year for him at this point. That's fair. 
John, I'm nothing without you. I don't look on the internet for stuff. I don't listen to all sports radio. So like I, you, I, without you, I don't have a show here. So I, <laughs> I, I appreciate it. Uh, uh, the other uh, New Yorker who's kind of in it a little bit and in his walk here is Gleyber Torres. Uh, obviously, there was a big story since we last did the show on Friday night. Uh, he had a line drive that smacked the wall in left center field. Uh, he didn't run at all, hardly. I loved your lead the other day. He was taking his walk here too seriously, uh, going to first base. Uh, but uh, ultimately, about 45 minutes later, it seemed to dawn on Aaron Boone to take him out of the game. We heard some nonsense about that uh, initially. Uh, Oswaldo, Oswaldo Cabrera, he had to get Oswaldo Cabrera, who switches into the game in the seventh inning or later all the time. Suddenly, he needed 45 minutes to get uh, ready. <laughs> I'm still not sure. Was, was it 45 it, minutes? I'm not sure it was 45 minutes. It, 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 that was an odd excuse that the, yeah. he was didn't want to rouse him from, rouse him from the dugout perch. Yeah. I don't know. That, I don't believe. I think the second day excuse, I'm going to buy that. I don't know why he didn't use it on the first day, uh, which was that he didn't want to embarrass him and pull him off the field because he, had, he made the last out of the inning. He would have been out at second base. Do you buy that at all? I kind of buy that. Except for that Aaron Boone was in television and he understands, smart guy who understands the implication of the Yes yeah. Network and others. He did remove him from the game from the top step of the dugout. It isn't like they went down the runway. He did it in public. It's still uh, better than pulling them off. The, someone t And I, I don't remember this, even though I'm pretty old. I guess Gil Hodges walked out in the field and, pulled, Jones. Jones yeah, and yeah. pulled him off. I mean, this day and age, you got social media, you got all this stuff. But he Billy did, Martin and Reggie? Yeah, he did downplay this one a bit by talking to him on the top step. Can I mean, I that's where you... he is. He's on the top step. I mean, if they both went back, they would, we would have noticed that too. He didn't pull him off the field. But he, the fact that he didn't say that immediately makes me question whether that was real. Because that, that seems like a good explanation to me. Why not give us that explanation? Maybe he had to get the blessing of the people upstairs. Or maybe the people upstairs called him and said, it's about time. We watched Josh Donaldson not do this like five Can't times. Can't out. Right. Yeah. You can't labor's rule it out done, this day and age, labor's right? Glaber's done it about like that. Look, it's a lot. And I know that what Aaron Boone would say is Glaber plays every day, you know, yes. kind, kind of stuff. I get it. I get it. Not run like it's overinflated, perhaps running hard, but there's a standard 90% good major league effort that he falls beneath too often. Uh, and I think it's gone on too long. And I'll tell you the two that drove me crazy that night, John. I talked about it on the Yankee webcast we do at the Post. Number one, uh, uh, Boone said that night uh, to defend Glaber, well, he plays his ass off. And I'm like, well, no, he doesn't. Like, <laughs> if he played his ass off, would you uh, you wouldn't have taken him out of the game. He's a repeat offender. Like, like if Oswaldo Cabrera, who plays his ass off, or Anthony Volpe, who plays his ass off, or by the way, Juan Soto, who plays his ass off, kind of put... Uh, pulls that boner, you know, like where he doesn't run. You're not going to pull him from the game. This is a repeat offender. Why the ca this was the straw that broke the camel's back. Probably should have happened previously, et cetera. The other thing is Aaron Judge says after the game, oh, you know, I know he's learned his lesson. No, he hasn't. Like, he, where, this has been an issue for seven years. Like, <laughs> by the way, if, if he actually needed to learn his lesson and nobody has addressed this to this point, from the owner to the GM to all the coaches to the manager to the captain of the team, shame on them. Because yeah, also, I mean, John, just one other thing, just real quick, because it isn't only base running. He's an absent-minded player. I just wonder if he has trouble, because we know he's not a bad guy, and we know no, he wants the nice Yankees guy. and wants to win. Right, agreed. So is, does he just not have the ability to concentrate <laughs> for three hours a night? Yeah, I don't, what got me was him saying uh, afterward, and of course he had to say it, that he was completely in the wrong and that Boone did the right thing. I mean, that was predictable seven years ago if he had, if Boone had done this. What, there's nothing else he could say. And, you know, do you think, is it possible he did this to show that Jazz Chisholm how things are done around here? I don't know. Maybe I'm overthinking it because, I mean, that's the one knock on Chisholm right? He works hard, like he practices hard, but actually in the game, he doesn't run out every single ball. That's the knock on him. I, I don't know. I'm probably overthinking it. I'm glad he did it. I, I like the second day excuse. I don't understand how Glaber, uh, you know, suddenly got religion and say, oh, of course I'm wrong. Hey, so you've been wrong for seven years in a row. Uh, there, was a lot, a lot there was a lot there. There was a lot there.
they have some serial offenders, you know, before you even get to Chisholm. Verdugo doesn't run them all out, yeah. you know. Um, Trent Grisham certainly right. doesn't. People are going to say Stanton, but I, Stanton's doing that to avoid Stanton's injury. to protecting yeah. his legs yeah. right. at, at this point. And again, no, Verdugo didn't do it the next day. Verdugo I know. was really hard. And, and, but Glaber and was. Glaber, at least he, he did it the next so day. so was Grisham. Yeah. The next day, right. also Grisham has right. run it hard. So maybe it was a message. We'll see if it 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 sticks across. And I think again, it's about more than just running hard. It's attention to detail. The Yankees are not a heady baseball team across the the the, the diamond. They make a lot of kind of forget the physical errors, which clearly Glaber's made a lot. There's been like just a lot of like bad secondary leads, bad, you know, like just, uh, you know, Trent Grisham, you know, not not good transfers to get the ball in quickly beyond the obvious one where we watch them botch it. So I I just think that there's like in the postseason, every 90 feet really matters even more than the regular season. And you just we've seen the Red Sox, you know, could be a playoff opponent kind of run around them. The Orioles have the young legs. If you end up against the Mariners in the playoffs where it's going to be hard to score runs because of their pitching, like 90 feet is yeah. going to really matter, and you just can't keep giving it away, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, we're back to our other topic. Every team looks flawed, right? The Red Sox, yeah. right, they can run around. They can do some great things. They're exciting. They're they young. They can't feel. They made more than 80 <laughs> errors at this yeah. point, right? I mean, they made a lot of errors. I mean, the Orioles, we thought they were a great team, right? And we thought they had the prospects to – be the one team to come up with somebody great. Now, Scooble was never going to get traded. That was a media creation. And, uh, you know, we were hoping something great would happen probably. And, you know, I think they considered Snell, but it was going to take a lot. Uh, but, you know, they, they they acquired a lot of players <laughs> at the deadline, and maybe they got a little better, but they don't look great either right now. Nobody, nobody looks great. I know we're picking on the Yankees for all their uh, deficiencies and inefficiencies, but – they're in a big uh, boat there with just about everybody. Uh, the Guardians uh, somehow have, uh, I think they have the best record as we do this, uh, but they have as, about as good a record as the Yankees, the Orioles, the Phillies, and the Dodgers. It's been those five teams that are basically around 65 and 45 now, not on the way to 100 wins. It's It's been a weird year, and maybe the Yankees, are, I know we see all the flaws, but maybe they're good enough because we don't see all the other flaws, and there are plenty around the league. John, I'll end the segment by saying this. I agree with you. But one of the things that always bothers me about the Yankees is they always tell us we're in it for the championships. And then when they're held to the standard of winning a championship, they don't like it. And I'm holding them to a high standard. I agree. I agree. I'm sure if I watch the Dodgers every day, if I watch the Phillies every day, I'd see this stuff also. I'm pointing it out because the Yankees consistently get eliminated in the postseason. And one of the reasons is they're not good at baseball. And then I hear terms like, but we're going to button it up and we're going to work on this and it doesn't really get better. And so to me, I'm holding them to the standard that they've publicly said they want to be held to, except for they kind of don't want to be held to it when, <laughs> when it's, it's like the Pete Alonso thing, when he's asked directly about like, man, you're really not performing in the way people don't like it. I get it. We don't have very popular jobs, but one of the guys, John, watch this transition. Who's great at answering every question. It's one of the reasons he's such a, a uh, special guy on the show. We uh, uh, we love having him on. A repeat uh, guy, Tommy Pham. He joins us after this break. Joining us is friend of the show, Tommy Pham. Friend of actually anybody who does what we do for a living. Uh, if you're a reporter, you love going to the locker, Tommy Pham. He's always available and always interesting. And Tommy, we appreciate you uh, joining us. And one of the reasons... We always want you. One of the reasons is you have been traded five times. You have been traded at the deadline four times. You have been traded at each of the last three deadlines. And I think on the last show we did together, you said, I got to get something like an assignment bonus to make sure of it. I think you did get it this time, $500,000. I wonder if you could tell us, like, on one hand, it does mean that you're very much wanted by contending teams. And you clearly, especially last year, helped the Diamondbacks uh, win a National League championship, but there's also your life, your family life, et cetera. Tell us about what it is like mid-season to be traded as often, including the last three years. Mid-season trades are tough for players. Um, you know, getting reacclimated to a new city, new team, that, that's, that's really tough. Then um, last year, it was kind of unexpected for me personally because – Going into the season, I didn't think the Mets would 
be in that position. So, um, but this year, a little bit different. Um, I, I, I kind of knew the White Sox were going to be sellers. So you kind of pack different and, um, you know, you, you, you downsize on an apartment or condo, you just, your whole living situation and, and, and your mindset is, is different. Tommy, it's great to have you on once again, and thank you for mentioning me on the ESPN broadcast uh, as you were mic'd up <laughs> during the game. I uh, mentioned me and Jesse Rogers as two of the people who let you know it was the Cardinals, but let me ask you, you're going back, you're returning to the Cardinals. You've been there once before. Uh, you were very honest on the way out. You, you had a, There was an issue or two with the Cardinals. What was your reaction when you were, because I, when I texted you, I didn't see much of a reaction. There was a lot going on in your life at that moment, I'm sure. What was your reaction to going to the Cardinals? I know they gave you the fans gave you a standing ovation when you hit a uh, grand fam right away, a uh, game one. Um, what's it like being back in St. Louis and being back with that organization? Well, the, the fans make it special. You know, coming back here, playing for the Cardinals, the, the fans, they, they, they love their Cardinals. They adore you. They, they treat you like royalty. They make you just want to go out there and, play hard and, and play the best you possibly can. The uh, training staff and the med staff, uh, a lot of familiarity with. Uh, uh, a lot of these guys I've known since, you know, minor league days. So that's always good. Another thing that's good is, um, you know, they, the Cardinals here, they, they, they test you, you know, on um, certain mobility, strength, things and it's good to have the familiarity there from you know back when I was here to see where I was back then and where I'm at today on on ways on things I could possibly be better at um I'm kind of excited about that when I when I was traded here I was I was a, a little shocked um because uh I didn't I didn't think the I didn't hear anything about the Cardinals you know I I heard I heard some stuff from other teams, but not the Cardinals. And talking to Getze, you know, he was kind of – he put me in a loop with two teams maybe two weeks ago, and, and the Cardinals weren't one of those teams. So I, I was a little shocked. But he he said that Mo insisted that I be included in the Fetty trade. So, um, you know, hearing that, it's like, oh, okay, you know what? I'm, I'm wanted here. It's always good to be wanted. But I, I was a little shocked um, just because, I, you know, I didn't hear anything about, about the Cardinals. And um, we, we have had some talks with them uh, this offseason, and they, I was told that they were going to stay internal. But, you know, and things change middle of the season. Can I guess? Atlanta and San Francisco? Who were the two teams that were interested? Um, he said uh, the Dodgers, Phillies. Then, um, you know, reports came out. Um, I was Atlanta. I, I was told by uh, one teammate that Atlanta was going to make a run. Um, I was told by Jesse Pittsburgh was trying to make a run. Um, you know, Getsy actually asked me, you know, was there one team I didn't want to get traded to? And um, for the most part, man, I told him I'm, I'm open to every team. You know, I just – want to play I, I love to play the game yeah you know uh tommy you mentioned uh that when you signed with the white Sox, you figured this would be your fate uh because the white Sox weren't going to be contenders just wonder did you think it could get this bad they've lost 21 straight games and can you put a finger on it like uh why, why is it this bad what's wrong with the water on that side of chicago uh, you you don't ever expect a team to lose twenty one games, man. Baseball just baseball just ain't having its way on the on the south side this year. It's, you can't put your finger on one thing, man. We're we're just bad as a group, you know. I, I think it's wrong to signal out the manager or you know the the GM. It, it's it's as a group you lose, you know. You can't you can't pin it on one person. You know, we we had games where our pitching gave us a chance to win, and you know our 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 hitting didn't, and vice versa. 
you know, then uh, we had games where late in the game, we just, you know, uh, we couldn't close it, finish it on out. It's just, it, it's, it's a collectible thing. Guys over there are, are doing their best to be better. Um, the coaches over there are, are, are still coaching, still instructing. It's just, the thing about this game, and, and you guys see it today, man, it, it's getting younger and younger. You know, n- right now, the younger players might not necessarily be ready. You know, so it, it there's there's challenges within that. You were sent out of there uh, before it became historic. They tied the American League record with 21 straight defeats yesterday, and now they're I don't say aiming, but uh, the modern record, I think, is 23. The overall record is 26. But you do not like to lose. How did you handle this personally? Uh, did you take it personal? Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, of course, you know, because over there I wasn't I wasn't playing my best. But it, it, it's tough. You know, I remember Mike Schilt told, told my team in AA when he was managing us in AA is – he said, uh, it's tough to put up numbers on a bad team. And, you know, when he when he told me that, I you know, you kind of kind of goes in one ear out the other. But it didn't resonate with me as much until this season when uh, you really start to see it. Like from an um, offensive standpoint this this year, I've, I've never faced so many leverage arms in a season. Um while I was on the White Sox, you know, it was like every day we were facing the eighth and ninth inning guy. And that that's tough. You know, you just don't you don't make a living hitting off of those guys. But, you know, when you're in close games all the time um, and the, the starters going deep, that's just that's just the nature of the game. You're always going to face um, in that division, too. <laughs> you know, the Jacks and and. Um, Duran and Classe, like the, those guys are, are really tough, man. And here we are always facing them. It's just you, you don't make a living hitting off of them. And um, as a team, you, you need everybody to to just do good, really, you know, to, to help you out. And uh, Tommy. Mike, Sh- Mike Shield's statement never resonated with me um, as much as it did this year. Tommy, you obviously and Eric Fetty were traded from the White Sox, Eloy Jimenez. There was almost as much news about someone who wasn't traded, right? Garrett, Garrett Crochet, uh, who was an all-star this year and made up through his agency, made a public stance about uh, not wanting to go to the bullpen if he got traded and not wanting to pitch in the postseason unless he got an extension if there was a, a trade. Uh, you're about as competitive as a guy as we deal with, and yet there's players' rights also, and this is a guy coming back from not pitching a lot for pretty much his whole career. What you, would you think about Garrett Crochet's stand uh, leading into the trade deadline? And what do you think of Garrett Crochet? You were his teammate. He's a, he's a great guy. Um, he's a competitor. He works hard. And, and he's a he's a stud on, on, on the mound. I, I honestly wasn't mad at him for saying it because I told him, well, look what happened to me. I said... I got traded to a team that I played hurt for for two months. You know, my my foot was messed up for two months. I I reached all my incentives. I I could have I could have took it home in September, and but I I chose to play hurt for a team that had no no obligations with me after the season. Um, I was getting shot up with Toradol every week during the postseason playing hurt for the team, and was I rewarded for it? Absolutely not. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not mad at him one bit because there's no loyalty in the game from, from the, the front, front office side. So he's protecting his, his family. You know, it, it, now if he was to get traded, it, it, it would definitely suck to be, uh, you know, watch him not possibly pitch in the postseason. But, you know, seeing the the business side of the things, um, I can't be mad at him. I, I took more than half of a pay cut 
to play this year. And I, I, I played hurt for two months when I could have easily just went on the, the DL and made sure my foot was right before I played. The only thing that suffered in that was, was my numbers. You know, my WRC went down playing hurt. Um, but the only thing that helped the team was my presence in the lineup now. Yeah, absolutely. I didn't realize that with the Diamondbacks last year. I was covering you guys uh, through the playoffs. Um, you know, you had maybe your numbers overall weren't as good as they were with the Mets, but you had a big finish. You had a four for four game. Uh, and I think you gave up an at bat, right, to Jace Peterson when you were four for four. You could have been five for five. I would think that counts in free agency. Uh, but, you know, I mean, tell us what exactly free agency was like. I mean, you saw your old team. Sign a guy you had a little bit of a rivalry with, uh, Jock Peterson, which people know about, for a very, very large contract. And uh, what was it like for you uh, not having that option? Uh, I'm sure you had other there's possibilities. No, there's, there's, there's no rival rivalry with me and Jock. That that that's over with. Um, free agency. I thought it was going to be a better free agency for me because there was a, a ton of interest from about half the teams, which in comparison to the year before there, there just wasn't that. Um, but as month by month passed um, and no offers came in, it was like, all right, what's going on? Then I didn't get my first offer until after spring training started. So, you know, that's odd within itself. So, um, you know, I think it's kind of, you know, the nature of our CBA now. So it's going to be interesting. I, I would assume it's probably going to happen again next year to a lot of guys. And, you know, maybe the year before the CBA, things will start changing. <laughs> so we'll see. Yeah. It's funny how that goes. Um, if I could just go back to the trade, you were, you were traded with Eric Fetty who was a first-round draft choice. It didn't really work with the Nationals. He went to play in the KBO in the Korean League, and he came back, and he's been terrific. Can you, you tell uh, – he seems like a remade pitcher. Is, 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 is it as good as it looks on a statistical line? Uh, fellas, I, I put him down as a, a, a all-star in my, on my ballot when, uh, when, you know, when the players voted. Um, I thought he, you know – Start after start, he was going out there giving the team an opportunity to win. Um, he just gets out, and and what's wrong with that? You know, um, at the time he had uh, one of the highest wars uh, amongst pitchers. Um, you know, it just wasn't on a, a a sexy team. You know, you put you put him on. Um, you know, let's say. Uh, a winning team at the at the All Star break, he's probably an All Star. Just you know, um, when when you're not on a winning team and and you're playing good like him, it's it's tough to really get the All Star appearance you he probably deserved. Yeah, I just want to say I'm with you on Crochet. I thought he was a terrific guy. Met him at the All Star game, and same with Fetty. I mean, he was seven and four with the White Sox. That's yeah. Pretty amazing. So I, I think you had a good, a very good point there about your teammates. I just want to know if you're still in touch with the White Sox guys. Do you follow it? Are you rooting for them not to break the record? And how are you? Yeah, how are you of course, man. Of course, I, I, I'm seeing every day if they won the game. Uh, it just hasn't come yet. Um, there has been a lot of guys that have texted me um, on that team, but um, I'm pulling for them. You know, uh, we became friends. So, you know, you just – you don't want to see your guy struggle. Uh, Tommy, uh, you were met last year. Uh, and in our opening block, we were – John and I were talking about a few things, including Pete Alonso's struggles uh, this year, especially runners in scoring position. But just the numbers across the board are kind of down for a guy who's had a really good run and who's in his walk year. You played with him, surprised at all? That is – the walk you're getting to him, you mentioned how good the pitching is in general. I mean, I think the league-wide batting average is 243 this year. Uh, what, what do you think when 
uh, on Alonzo. I didn't. I didn't realize he's struggling. Um, I haven't. I haven't really been following Pete. This is uh, news to me. Um, I saw he had twenty plus homers on the board. So, I mean, it looks like he's gonna. Knowing Pete, he's gonna get over thirty, maybe over thirty five. So that's. I mean, maybe that's a down year for him. I mean, I would love to have that <laughs> right now. Um, you know, I don't, geez, I only have six. You know, it's the balls aren't going this year. You know, it's 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 really affecting me. I thought the White Sox, I thought the ball in in, in Chicago was deader than on the road, and um, I complained to MLB about that. Um, it it of course gotten got nowhere, but you know, I I just think. The ball ain't flying, but it has nothing to do with exit velocity. Like, why Why is my exit velocity down? I, I know what feels like 110 off the bat versus not. You know, I'm barreling up balls this year that on the board it says, you know, 98. And I'm like, there's no way that's at least 105. So, you know, maybe that's happening over there with Pete. Maybe he's hitting balls that might feel like one. 10 to 115 and it's only you know 105 uh, it, the balls feel really soft this year I, I have some I've, I've kept some balls um, there's been reports that the drag is down you know it's you know there's a reason why the offenses offensive numbers are way down and the pitching numbers are are better this year it's it's there's no coincidence you know I haven't uh, heard I, that much go ahead sorry yeah, the, the Pete, I don't – Pete, to me, has one of the best swings in, in baseball. I really like his movement. Um, I don't I don't see him being a guy that's going to struggle. You know, I haven't heard that much. I mean, we know the offensive numbers are way down, and the league at batting average is in the two, low 240s. The OPS is around 700 or so, so maybe a little bit over that. Uh, I mean, is this something you guys – you talk about with all your teammates and other people and – is there a consensus on this? Because I really had not heard this that much about the ball. Yeah, it, oh, it's definitely down. Um, I've I've talked I've talked to a lot of people. You guys remember that ball uh, that I hit and Kowser robbed me in center field, and um, it was off Kimbrough. Um, it said it was one hundred and two at twenty nine, and I was looking up at the scoreboard, you know, when he caught it to see how hard I hit it and it said 102 and I was just like I was kind of looking like there's no way I just hit that ball 102 it felt like at least 105 plus and that like how I, I just want to know how the exit velocity is down when my strength numbers are up so I it, it's then you know if you hit a ball to center field or oppo like it just it's just not traveling like it's almost like you you have to pull the ball out to get it out but we'll see you know tv games ball usually flies better um we'll, we'll see man maybe maybe it might be that like that year in 2022 when that report came out we shall see you know i want to ask you one more more personal type question uh, you've talked about this occasionally. Uh, you have an eye condition, uh, and how is that? How is that go? Keratoconus, I think it's called. Yeah. Keratoconus. How is that going? How how much of a? Because a lot of people are amazed that you're able to play uh, Major League Baseball because it certainly does affect eyesight. Uh, where where does that stand now? Have you had surgeries, or where or is it eye drops, or how does that? How do you deal with it? Yeah, basically, I've had a surgery. Um, in 2011, that stabilized the condition, basically kept my condition from progressing. And I need really advanced contact lenses to play. The One of the biggest issues with me is, and I work with a lot of doctors. Granted, I, I have a, a, a really great team who, I mean, I'm, I'm lucky to have these doctors because uh, they're, they're so helpful. And um, they do everything for me to try to help me see the ball better 
on the field. And there's been technology that has come out that has kind of helped keratoconic eyes with uh, for contact lenses. And there's a certain contact lens. It's, uh, it, it came out last year, and I'm the guinea pig. I'm the guinea pig. That's the only problem, you know. Um, I'm the guy testing these lenses out, giving the information back to docs. Um, and I've literally gone through at least a hundred different pairs of contact lenses from this company. Um, and you know, they're not, they're not cheap. <laughs> um, granted, you know, I've, um, I've, I look at it as an investment, uh, because once I figure this out, it's, it's going to be perfect. Now, let me, I'm going to explain this to you guys. You guys got to follow me. Think of your, think of your eye as a clock, right? You know, 12 o'clock all the way around. There's three components to a contact lens, right? There's the astigmatism issue. For me, I have really bad astigmatism. Now you need the astigmatism to sit at the right axis. So let, let's say I need the astigmatism to sit at six o'clock, but it's, but it, the lens is at, but it's sitting at four o'clock. My vision won't be as precise because it's not sitting at the right axis. So um, then there's, of course, the right amount of power. You know, you don't want to be over minus because um, there's effects with that playing wise. So I've never been able to play with astigmatism in my lenses because I have a football shaped eye and putting a circular lens on a football shaped eye, there's movement issues. Well, the technology has come out now we now we're able to put astigmatism in my lens and a GP lens because the fit is stable, right? So last year I was playing with astigmatism for the first time in my career. Um, it might not have been at the right axis because I got the lenses literally right before spring training. So what we found out is, all right, now we got it at this axis, which is pretty much the hard part. And... Now we're just trying to figure out, you know, what power to put in to give me the best visual performance on the field. So, you know, I've I've learned a lot. You know, I've I've told the eye doctors if they could cut off half half the amount of years, I'll go I'll go to school to be an eye doc. I just don't want to do <laughs> eight years. Uh, you know, give me like four years already and I'm I'm there. Sure. But yeah. But, it's a deal. You know, I'm right. <laughs> I, I'm I'm the guinea pig. You know, I'm I'm figuring this stuff out. Um I'm I'm figuring out how much astigmatism I need, at what axis, um, at what and how much power I need. You know, I'm it, it, it's a process. And that's why spring training is so important for me because I use a lot of those at bats to test out these lenses, not really caring anymore, you know, how my performance is until like, you know, the last week or so of spring training, because I'm, I'm testing out these lenses, giving information back to the doctors and, and letting them know about, you know, this particular lens. Do I think it's, do I think it has potential or whatnot uh, to help out others? Because we're learning that a lot of, Baseball players have keratoconus now. Granted, uh, some of them, a lot of them are pitchers, but I, I know, I know some hitters too. Can't well, be easy. Can't be easy. Didn't yeah. didn't your pitcher on the Arizona have a Nelson? I think. Has yeah, 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 yeah. He has it, man. He has it. Um, I've learned Reynaldo Lopez has keratoconus. He had a surgery. Um, that's why he's pitching a lot better. You know, he got his vision fixed. Um, there, there's quite a few guys. There's a lot of minor leaguers, actually. But it's harder with hitting, I would think, than pitching. Definitely, definitely <laughs> harder yeah. to hit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, that was great of you to share, Tommy. I, I think we, we really appreciate it. I think all our viewers and listeners will appreciate it. Why don't I end it with one last uh, personal, another personal one, which is I, I, I want to give some roses here. Uh there's only seven players left from the 2006 draft. 
It's Kershaw, Scherzer, Adam Adovino, who was also picked by the Cardinals your year, Justin Turner, Paulo Espino, I wasn't expecting, David Robinson, and you from the 16th round. Let's think about that. You know, 18 years ago from the 16th round, it's pretty, pretty impressive. Uh, we see how modern you stay, the way you could talk about your eye situation. I just wrote down, you talked about WRC, you talked about war, you talked about <laughs> exit velocity, you, you talked about drag. So I know you're staying young, but you are 35. You'll be 36 by the next one. You've gone through a lot of crap as far as trying to 36. get contracts. Yeah, 36. <laughs> as far as trying to get contracts and stuff uh, and getting traded, how much law you are you back next year? How much longer do you want to do it? I feel like I have uh, a lot more game left. Granted, uh, I, I've been jokingly telling everybody on on uh, you know the White Sox, and and I told Willie McGee this on the Cardinals. I just wiped out um, nine years of positive de defensive run saved in three months in Chicago. <laughs> um, so I, I don't I don't know how the front offices are going to view me now because. I don't think I'm, I'm minus 13 DRS and, you know, I'm getting docked on, on crazy things that I feel like I have no control of. And, you know, the front offices now are going to view me as um, a liability now when I don't, I don't view myself that. And, um, you know, if you were to see me play and you would say, man, he's minus 13, you would be, flabbergasted by that but I do think um I still could play I mean uh, I just got to figure out why I'm not hitting as many home runs this year um because that's an element of 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 the game that teams are going to want um but I think they still value you know my my at bats um you know um I'm, I'm I'm a tough out um I know how to play the game Oh, it, it also says I'm I'm a negative base runner, which I've never been a negative base runner in my career. So I, I have two months left to write the shit, J and J. <laughs> so uh let me see what I can do, man. So I, I still want to play. I still love the game. Um I mean, playing at a significant discount again, that 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 to me is is kind of disrespectful when I see how much guys make around the league um I'm, I'm i'm not on board with that but we'll see <laughs> let me ask you this i mean you've you've lost some weight you did start as a center fielder you started opening day as a center fielder your first uh, year that you made uh, the team at spring training with the cardinals uh is it possible that uh, you know i don't think they're just willy-nilly giving bad grades to everybody with the White Sox. Is it possible that it has to do with the positioning and they didn't have the positioning correct for you and that, that explains the uh, unusual uh, DR, DR, is it DRS? I'm not sure. Yeah. It's above yeah. average, whatever it is. Yeah, that... yeah. DRS. There, there, there's many elements involved in, in DRS. Uh, outs above average, I, it, I think it's a flawed stat too. Um, I, I was arguing with um, um, the analytics over in Chicago all the time. Everybody knew I was mad with the uh, positioning over there. Then I was told they're ranked in the middle of the pack, and um, I told them, well, that's not accurate with what I'm seeing on the field. There's just a common sense element that, that in, in an in-game element that's not quantified now. Like, you could – you could see how a guy's pitching a hitter and you could say, all right, you know, I see this and I know he's going to hit the ball to my right. And I'm, I'm positioned in the gap, in the oppo gap, you know, then when he hits the ball down the line, it's like, man, you know, I, I saw this, you know, instinctually then, you know, they always tell you, well, you had the freedom to move when, but they're grading us on our positioning. So, uh, you know, how much freedom is there to move? You know, if I'm being graded on my positioning, then also, you know, you get penalized for, let's say there's a guy on first base, right? And a ball gets hit down the right field line or the left field line, um, you know, for an extra base hit. If that guy scores from first base, you're going to get docked. 
And a lot of people don't know that. You know, if a guy, if a base runner goes first to third, second to home, you get docked in the outfield. Your your job is to prevent the extra 90. You know, you got to keep him from from taking the extra base. But, you know, let's say you're playing in the gap. Let's say I'm playing in right center field and the and the, the hitter hits a ball, you know, through that 3-4 hole. Can I really prevent him from going first to third, second to home? No, you, you can't. So, I mean, I wish – I wish that they would just make every hitter play straight up. Or I'm sorry, they make every defender play straight up so that you guys could really see, you know, all right, if we all played straight up and there's no positional element involved, where will we where will we rank? You know, then uh, you know, in the White Sox, I was, there was a lot of balls where I was playing right field and I'm playing to the line and we got Robert playing in the gap. And there's a ball hit to right center, which, you know, off the bat, I'm like, oh, it's the center fielders. Then it falls. And, you know, of course, I get docked because, you know, the stat cast says it's closer to me. But instinctually, it's like that that's his ball. You know, if I'm playing over, instinctually, you you know, I'm not, you're telling me I'm guarding the line and, and in, not right center. So – then they then everything's quantified now, you know. All you you only ran for that ball at twenty seven feet per second, and you could your top is twenty nine point something, you know. So it there there's a lot of elements involved, man, and it's just it's there's just no common sense, you know. My my instincts of the game get my nine plus years in the majors plus my time in the minors gets thrown out. You know, because the 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 computer says this. Well, we're going to create a new stat and you're going to be the champion of it, which is CSAA, common sense above average. And <laughs> you're you're our, I love it. You're you're going to be our champ for it. And you're, you're our champ for coming on. We, we always appreciate it, Tommy, when you join us. And as always, we do do again now. Uh, good luck down the stretch with the Cardinals. And by the way, we'll do it early. Good luck in the offseason. I hope you don't go through the grinder again. Thank you, fellas. Appreciate you guys. John and I thank Tommy Pham, of course, for joining the show. John, hit or error? I'm going to say hit for the uh, L.A. Dodgers and their fans for that warm reception for Freddie Freeman coming back. Guy never misses a game. He, uh, of course, missed a game for his young son, three years old, Max, uh, who was out with a serious ailment uh, in the ICU for a week. He is back home now, thankfully, and I thought it was very warm, very touching, and a very nice welcome back for Freddie Freeman. Can I give a hit? Not, uh, there's no error in the Yankees acquiring Juan Soto, obviously. He's the best hitter in baseball, probably not named Aaron Judge. Uh, but you know what? The Padres made a pretty good trade. I'm going yeah. to give him a hit there. They tr- turned Drew Thorpe into Dylan Cease. Uh, Michael King, the question was about durability. He didn't make his last start because he got hit in the calf by a ball, but he's up at uh, 124 in the third innings. Uh, as we're speaking, he pitches Tuesday night. He's got a 326 ERA. Kyle Higashioka has over a 500 slugging percentage. He's hit a bunch of home runs this year. And Vasquez has been part of their rotation. And Brito has been up and down as part of the bullpen. Not a bad haul for Soto when you consider how bad some returns are on great players, especially great players in their walk year. Yeah, I mean, A.J. Preller, the the GM of the Padres, he looked like he was going to cry that night when he gave up (laughs) Soto. But you know what? Uh, we knew Michael King was going to be really good. He was outstanding at the end of the year last year for the Yankees. You have to give up something good to get something great, and they certainly did. Padres look good to me. I mean, uh, you know, they're they're keeping fort, holding the fort uh, right now in the, in the rotation, obviously with Cease and King at the top of it. Uh, Vasquez in it as well, but uh, Musgrove should be back in, soon, and uh, they're hoping Darvish is back, and they have that lockdown bullpen at the back end with Adam with Scott and with Suarez, nobody's got a bullpen like that. And, uh, you know, and to do that in this year where, you know, everybody was holding their prospects and teams were demanding a ton for anybody and even rental relievers, 
uh, you know, I think they're going to turn out to be okay. A lot of people were kind of ripping the Padres for giving up so much for a rental reliever, but hey, they got a shot at the World Series and they're they're taking it. Yeah, and their fan base loves it, and they're coming out to the ballpark. So that's that's really really something. Also, uh, and let's not forget Fernando Tatis Jr. hasn't been playing either, and they should get him back probably for the stretch at some some point. Uh, we always thank our producers, Jake Brown and Tommy Hogan for helping us through the show. Thanks, Jake and Tommy, uh, the New York post sports YouTube page. Give us a view Apple, Spotify, wherever you listen to your podcast rate and review. And John, we're getting into the dog days here about what? Seven, eight weeks left in the season. I hope everyone sticks with us on the show with Joel Sherman and John Heyman.